Chapter 2 The rest of the populace is more wicked than even the heathen themselves, for most married people do not desire offspring. Indeed, they turn away from it and consider it better to live without children, because they are poor and do not have the means with which to support a household. But this is especially true of those who are devoted to idleness and laziness and shun the sweat and the toil of marriage. But the purpose of marriage is not to have pleasure and to be idle, but to procreate and bring up children, to support a household. This, of course, is a huge burden, full of great cares and toils. But you have been created by God to be a husband or a wife, and that you may learn to bear these troubles. Those who have no love for children are swine, stocks, and logs unworthy of being called men or women, for they despise the blessing of God, the creator and author of marriage. Martin Luther Alternate Viewpoint Number 1 Another view on Onan by a concerned friend. What has been written on spilling the seed of, by Onan has been used to burden many consciences. Nobody has the right to burden the conscience wherein God does not burden it. There is probably no married man, not even such as condemns the spilling of the seed most vehemently, who is not guilty of spilling the seed. Marriage is given not only for producing children, but also for the joy of sexual intercourse. Since this is so, every man who has intercourse with his wife during her infertile period is spilling the seed. Then intercourse during the fertile period, almost always only one sperm and two penetrates the egg of the female. All the rest, millions of them, are spilled, wasted. The Hebrew word used in Genesis 38 means to waste, corrupt, destroy, devastate. All but one are destroyed, wasted, spilled, if you will. They do not produce. God himself destroys the seed in regular intercourse, in night losses, in menstruation, all natural processes. Onan is, is said to have been killed by God because he spilled the seed. There is nothing in the whole Bible that specifically condemns the spilling of the seed. But there is something in the Bible that says that the brother of a dead husband should go into his widow to raise up children for the dead, specifically the firstborn of the union. All kinds of sexual sins are condemned in the word but not once the spilling of the seed. A brother could refuse to marry the dead brother's wife and not be killed for it. And so it is said the only difference between such an unwilling brother and Onan was that Onan spilled the seed and that therefore God killed him immediately, according to Luther. There was another difference, a big difference. Onan did not refuse to marry Tamar, his brother's widow. If he had Tamar, according to Deuteronomy 25, 5-10, could have taken off his shoe and spit into his face and thus shamed him. No, he married her. But he destroyed the seed during intercourse. Why? Lest that he should give seed to his brother. That was his sin. To raise up seed for the brother was why Judah told Onan to marry Tamar, to go into her. We read, And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Therefore he slew him also. The Lord had slain Onan's wicked brother before that. What was the thing that displeased the Lord? Onan did three things. He spilled the seed. He prevented birth. He refused to give seed to this brother, although he married the widow. The whole idea was to raise up seed for his brother. Spilling the seed was only a means to that end, wicked end. It was like taking a vow and not fulfilling it. There's a question whether God killed Onan immediately. The Hebrew verb used in Genesis 38-9 means in the tense used here, P.O. often, much for a long time. It seems that God gave him to repent of his refusal to give his brother seed, but Onan persisted, so God killed him. The NIV and AAT both translate, not when, but whenever, so also other translators. How can anybody say that spilling the sea is worse than adultery or even incense? Especially disturbing is this view, view of the fact that nowhere in the Bible is spilling of seeds specifically forbidden. How can we condemn it if God spills the seed in night losses, intercourse, and menstruation? It is said that wasting the sea is a violation of God's command to be fruitful and multiply. In the first place, this is not an absolute command. Jesus did not marry. Paul did not marry. Many cannot marry, even if they would. Secondly, God does not say anywhere that we must have as many children as possible. A person may be said to be fruitful, even if he has only six children, although having been capable of having many more. God told our first parents to fill the earth. The earth is pretty well filled up. If all people from the beginning had all the children they could possibly bear, there would perhaps be no standing room on the earth. It said that God would supply the need of all the children brought into the world, even if everybody produced as many children as possible. That a large family should not worry anybody. We know that God has 
less richly many large families. But we all know families, large families, that cannot buy their food. They cannot pay their rent. They are suffering. They are families in our own churches. Does this mean that Jesus failed to keep his promise in Matthew 6? No. If they are alive, the promise is being kept. He has his ways of providing. Jesus may be testing the family, or the family lacks faith or initiative. Paul was hungry at times. In Hebrews 11, we read of the martyrs, who at times were destitute. A destitute family may hesitate to add to an already suffering group. If what Provan wrote is true, then nobody will be saved outside of a handful of a handful. If any form of wasting the seed is sinful, then nobody will be saved, not any married folk. If any form of birth control is wrong, then perhaps few people will be saved. I do not presume to advocate any form, but I don't want to judge those who use some forms of it, even if it involves wasting some seed. I believe it is faulty exegesis to condemn all spilling of the seed on the basis of the own story. I repeat, everybody does it in some way or other. The seed is not human life, it were Think of the millions of lives wasted in every intercourse. I end as I began. Nobody has the right to burn conscious wherein God does not burden them. Rebuttal. Replying to a concerned friend on the subject of Onan. Since the Christian News on March 21, 1988 has printed a rebuttal to my article against birth control, uh, February 29, 1988, it is necessary for me to produce a counter-rebuttal so that the readers of Christian News may judge for themselves which position is scriptural. Because our theological opponent on this issue has called himself a concerned friend, we will call him this throughout our reply. When we use this term, we do not use it sarcastically, nor do we doubt his or her sincerity in attacking our position. Rather, we believe that our concerned friend is to be highly commended for his thinking about a subject which is very rarely considered by churchgoers today. For this, we are truly appreciative, for it is not the road to changing one's mind on something begin by considering the subject first. A friend begins his main argument by attempting to demonstrate that all omission of semen results in the death of the vast majority of the semen. It is of course true that each time sexual intercourse takes place, many individual sperm die, since only one sperm unites with the female egg. Many sperm die during nocturnal omissions. Therefore, our concerned friend thinks that there is no difference between deliberate, intentional destruction of semen and the death of semen which takes place nor during non-birth control sexual intercourse. However, this reasoning is not correct, because it leaves out the factor of the human will and intent concerning this subject. The scripture is explicit. This makes the difference between sin and not sin in many cases. For example, suppose a married woman is discovered engaging in sexual intercourse with a man who is not her own husband. What does the Bible say? The woman who engages in this act willingly is worthy of death. Leviticus 20.10 But if the woman is forced at gunpoint to do this thing, the woman goes free without any blame being attached to her. Deuteronomy 22.25-27 In both cases, the act is the same. The only difference is the will of the female. This makes the difference between life and death. So it is with the death of the semen. If we have done our limited part to be fruitful and multiply, it is enough. God does the rest, for after all, it is God who creates children. But birth control involves intentional destruction of semen, the ultimate goal of which is to destroy the single semen which might combine with the female egg conceiving a child. To use another example, sometimes a woman who is pregnant will unintentionally do something which inadvertently causes a spontaneous abortion, otherwise known as a miscarriage. She may accidentally fall down the steps, for instance. Do we attach moral blame to the woman? No. Rather, we sympathize with her misfortune. If a woman goes to a doctor and pays him to exterminate her child while it is yet in the womb, we correctly say that she is a murderess. The results are exactly the same in both of our hypothetical cases. But how different are the acts in the eyes of God? God is determined by the intent and action of the woman. According to our concerned friend, Onan was killed by God for refusing to give seed to his brother. Well, let's point out again that the man in Deuteronomy 25.7.9 also refuses to give seed to his brother. Yet this man is not killed. Therefore, the difference in conduct is the key to the difference in punishment. And the only difference in conduct is this. While both refused to give seed to his brother, only Onan destroyed his seed. Therefore, it is for this that he was killed by God. When we say this, we are not saying on our own. We are saying it because careful consideration of the scripture proves it. And... In 1800 years of church history, the view that Owen was killed because of his intentional destruction of semen is the universal view of the Christian church. It is only our wonderful modern day churches that birth control has become approved. 
Let us be quick to point out that our century has also produced churches in abundance which have amazingly repudiated the infallibility of the scriptures, churches which assert that abortion isn't murder and homosexuality isn't a perversion. We are by no means saying that those who disagree with us on birth control are in agreement with any of the preceding. We are merely pointing out that the same bad tree which produced the theological denial of scripture and the theological acceptance of homosexuality Abortion also pushed for the acceptance of birth control. We ask you where this view that birth control is morally acceptable originate, with those who believe the Bible, using it as their guide, or with non-believers. Any study of the modern birth control movement will show that it did not originate in the Holy Church of God, but rather in pagans like Margaret Sanger. Getting back to the statement of our friend that Onan's spilling of seed is no different than spilling of seed which occurs during non-birth control sexual intercourse, we would also point out a fact which he has not commented upon, namely that out of all the verses which mention the omission of semen in the Old Testament, the Onan verse, Genesis 3, 8, 9, he wasted his seed on the ground, is the only verse to employ the word shakat, which means to waste, corrupt, destroy, devastate. As our friend has noted, this word is used in many passages as a synonym for killed. See, for example, Genesis 6, 17, 9, 15, and Judges 20, 21. Do you think that there might be a reason for Onan's omission of seed to be described as a killing of seed while all the other passages use words which merely mean emit? We do. In all other passages, no one does anything to intentionally harm the semen, but in Onan's case, he deliberately killed his. If, as our concerned friend says, there is nothing in the whole Bible that specifically condemns the spilling of the seed, then why does the scripture use the very negative word shakath? in Onan's case, but not in any of the others. Another question raised by our friend is this. How can anybody say the spilling of seeds is worse than adultery or even incest? Well, let me point out that Martin Luther said this, not me, but I think that his reasoning on the subject went something like this. Adultery and incest, though great evils, at least perform a sexual act in a natural manner, allowing nature to take its course. Onan, on the other hand, took steps to frustrate God's creative activity, perverting nature. Onan's deed is an assault upon the natural order of things, is therefore worse than adultery or incest. Luther may also have been influenced by the fact that although Tamar, Onan's wife, later committed incest with her father-in-law Judah, as Genesis 38 says, yet God did not kill her, but he did kill Onan. We are not at this point able to positively affirm Luther's particular statement, as we wish to carefully consider the subject first. But at the same time, neither do we wish to disagree with Dr. Luther, who certainly at the very least deserves our respect. So we will leave this particular statement on which sins are, are the worst, adultery and incest, or destroying one's semen, for later consideration. We emphatically do affirm, however, Luther's view on birth control, namely, that it is a great sin. Our friend also asked the question, how can we condemn it, the spilling of seed, if God himself spills the seed, in night losses, intercourse, and menstruation? We agree that God does indeed do these things, yet this does not mean that the intentional destruction of seed is permitted by no means. We can easily prove that our friend's logic is incorrect by examining parallel cases in the Bible. First, we shall examine the topic of miscarriages. The prophet Hosea says that God causes some miscarriages in order to punish people for sin. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Hosea 9.14 Does this mean that we humans are permitted by God to punish women by aborting their children? No, for Moses says that if a man causes an abortion, he shall be put to death. Exodus 21.23 Likewise, God kills people all the time, as God declares in Deuteronomy 32.39 And there is no other God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life, because God, without moral blame, kills people all the time. Does this mean that we can kill people when we please? Of course not. For God says to us, You shall not murder, Deuteronomy 5.17. In the Bible, it is stated that God has killed children for the sins of their parents. For example, God said to Jeroboam of northern Israel, You also have done more evil than all who were before you, and have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and to and have cast me behind your back. Images, therefore, behold, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bound and free to Israel, and I will make a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam, as one sweeps away dung until it is all gone. 1 Kings 14, 9-10, fulfilled in 1 Kings 15, 29. 
Yet God clearly forbids us from putting children to death for the sins of parents, as he says in Deuteronomy 24:16. Fathers shall not be put to death for the sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. Scripture contains many things which are allowable to God, but forbidden to us. So just because God caused the vast majority of semen to die without causing the birth of a child, this does not prove that it is morally acceptable for us to cause semen to die by means of birth control. Later, our friend says that the command of God to be fruitful and multiply is not an absolute command. Jesus did not marry. Paul did not marry. Many cannot marry even if they would. We would agree that the command to be fruitful and multiply is not an absolute command for all persons. We do not think that eunuchs, three-year-olds, women who are unmarried and so forth are obligated to do this because they are not or cannot be married. The command is not an absolute command for all people, just married people. This is not unusual, for the command was not given to Adam until God had given him a wife, which makes sense to us. Is it not obvious that God rules on divorce apply only to those folks who are married in the first place? God says that a husband should love his wife. Is this an absolute command of God? Yes, but obviously it only applies to men who have a wife. Just because the command to be fruitful and multiply does not apply to people who cannot or are not married, this by no means proves that it does not apply to those whom the command was given, namely, married couples. Next, our theological opponent says, God does not say anywhere that we must have as many children as possible. A person may be said to be fruitful, even if he only has six children, although having been capable of having more. Our reply is that God does not need to say this directly for it to be so. He says it by implication. When God gave this command to Adam to know his family and to Jacob, do you think God meant that they were to be fruitful before only a day or a month or a year or until they had a nuclear family or as long as they were able? We think that the latter option is correct since if God had thought it was all right to limit God's blessings to the above people, he would have said so in the pertinent passages. Our friends example of six, being a good number of fruitfulness, is to be faulted for the simple reason that to us, being fruitful and multiplying has no mandatory number. For Abraham and Sarah, the efforts to be fruitful produce only one child, Isaac, even though they multiply themselves by only one half. They had been doing their best to have children long before God himself made Isaac, and so they obeyed God to the extent of their ability. This is what God expects of us, not some particular number. What right do we have to cancel God's first blessing? He blessed them, Genesis 128, to marry couples. 7. Our friend says, God told our first parents to fill the earth. The earth is pretty well filled up, etc. I would ask, how does he know this? There are Christians and pagans who quite forcefully disagree with the idea that there is some sort of overpopulation crisis. For example, R.J. Rushduni in The Myth of Overpopulation and Jermaine Greer in Sex and Destiny, Chapter 14. In any case, let's look to scripture for our guidance, not to the high priest of the new religions, science, and news media. In Exodus 35, 4-9, God told the Israelites to donate gifts to Moses to help build the tabernacle. When enough gifts were received to build it, God gave a revelation to Moses to tell the Israelites to stop giving. Exodus 36, 5-7 If God would give a revelation to stop about something like this, don't you think that he would let us know when the world is full? to stop a command which has been in effect for some 7,000 years. We could also ask the question, if the world is full, so eliminating the command to be fruitful and multiply, then why does God still keep adding unnecessary people to the already overpopulated world? After all, he is the one who caused children to be created, as Psalm 139, 13 says, For thou didst my, form my inward parts, thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. So this objection to our opposition holds no water. 8. A friendly opponent makes the overstatement, the seed is not human life, though we of course do not think that millions of little people die when someone has a nocturnal mission. Nevertheless, the statement needs to be qualified. The fact of the matter is that each seed is alive in a different sense than that of an ordinary cell in the human body. Each seed is self-propelled and can live even when separate from the body. No other types of cells in the human body have the ability to create new and separate human life. Given the proper circumstances, except for the female egg, the female counterpart to the male seed. If the seed is not human life, then pray tell, what type of life is it? Both myself and my opponent once existed as seed, and I would call both him and myself human. If one eliminated all the human semen from the earth, one would thereby eliminate all future humans also. So there is a close connection between the two. So close that we do affirm that destroying semen is in effect destroying the children who would otherwise be born, and let it be plain to all, 
that those who practice birth control do so to eliminate children that they themselves do not wish to raise. They do not dislike the semen, they dislike the children the semen will turn into. In wartime, soldiers do not blow up trains because they don't like trains, they blow them up because they don't like what the trains deliver. It is of course true that nobody has the right to burn consciences wherein God does not burden them. We agree. But it's also true that we are commanded to declare to my people their transgression. Isaiah 58.1 So if birth control is a sin, that is a commendable and helpful to say so. Since the Bible says that it is a sin, and the Holy Church of Christ has, since its inception, declared it to be so, we come to the conclusion that we are guilty of no sin in declaring the Christians to not practice birth control. And I can truthfully say that my motives are to strengthen the church, not to tear it down. If our opposition to birth control causes, humanly speaking, only one Christian family to have only one more beloved child of God, we consider our writings on the subject to be well worth the effort and will praise God for the blessing.